LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is David Wagner, who joins us to discuss his book, Backbone, The Modern Man's Ultimate Guide to Purpose, Passion, and Power. If you enjoy the show, you might like to explore the extensive archive available at LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, and you can spell Legalize with a Z or an S. And there you'll also find a donate page, should you wish to contribute towards keeping the site up and running. What does it mean to be a powerful, happy man in today's world? What does it take for a man to know himself, know his mission in life, and live a life of strength, honour and wisdom? What do men need to be deeply fulfilled? Learning to be a good man used to be part of our culture. Sons learned from fathers, nephews learned from uncles, apprentices learned from masters. But today, this rarely happens. Modern men have to figure it out by themselves. Backbone is a practical, step-by-step guide to help men know themselves deeply, root out weaknesses, enhance strengths, and upgrade their experience of life. It combines no-nonsense wisdom with brutally honest exercises to help men find their purpose, be on track with their vision, hone their spiritual and emotional intelligence, get free from unhelpful beliefs, patterns, and habits, and live an amazing powerful, passion-filled life. Hello and welcome, David, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Yeah, great to be here. Looking forward to it. Excellent, David. Today we're going to talk a little bit about your book. It's called Backbone, The Modern Man's Ultimate Guide to Purpose, Passion and Power. Before we dive into that, just tell listeners a little bit about your personal background, your work in general, and your, your personal story, because it's very relevant to this, because this is the book and your other work has emerged from your life, because you've really had to walk the walk in this respect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Greg, I, I got into spirituality and transformational work in an early age, really because I had to. Um, I was into drugs and alcohol and um, what was a pretty self-destructive, unhappy kid for, you know, most of my childhood and adolescence. I grew up in a small town in, in kind of the middle of the United States. And um, just through, uh, you know, several strokes of grace, I ended up getting clean and sober uh, when I was still in high school. And um, basically from my senior year of high school onward, uh, I, I've, I've been clean and sober, but that launched me into the world of personal transformation and practical spirituality and all of the kind of stuff that, you know, these days is, is what I'm all about. But, um, yeah, it's been almost 30 years of just trying to live in a conscious way and pursuing um, you know, what I call an integrated spirituality, which is a spirituality that is not about an escape or um, avoiding life, but rather a spirituality that helps us be more excellent and engaged in our life in an excellent way. Now, I've never really been a fan of the category of self-help when it comes to books or dvds or whatever else it happens to be but i mean either <laughs> i guess if we went into a bookstore and, and found your book it'd probably be with other you know with self-help books but in any case whatever we want to call it uh, you pointed out that there there's really been a revolution in this area uh in the last few decades and it's sort of gaining momentum really it's just one of the big growth areas 
Um, yeah. Again, I think I guess the, the category in bookstores is mind, body, and spirit, isn't it? And that that didn't exist when I started started buying books, you know, back in the eighties. Um, but you point out rightly, this has been very female orientated, and there's you know, some obvious reasons for that. You know, we know the old cliche of women being more in touch with their feelings, yada yada yada. But there has been a, some fallout from this because it's not that you know this has entirely been a, a loss for you know the male. <laughs> species but this female orientation has how can i put it it's not been very it's not been very welcoming uh for men in many respects yeah yeah i mean it's interesting because just and i'm i'm just actually thinking this almost for the first time as i'm saying it right now so forgive me if i don't articulate it that well but um that's the assumption is the is the one that you said which is that the reason why it hasn't been why there hasn't been more for men in the self-help world is because women are more predisposed to, to you know, being in touch with their feelings and that sort of thing. But right now, as I'm thinking about it, I don't think that that's it, Greg, because um, w- women might be more predisposed to, to be in touch with their feelings. But I think really what it is is that prior to the say 1950s um it was rare for women to do any kind of transformational work um and and it's not that no one was doing it men were doing it and in particular men who were like powerful men would seek out that which would help them to be more powerful and more effective um I think that what it is, is it's not so much that women are more in touch with their feeling. I think it's that women have been on this, on this growth curve in terms of personal power since the 1950s. And they've just needed help. They've just needed stuff to help them to, to know themselves more and to be able to overcome their weaknesses. Whereas men, um, we almost like kind of stepped back a little bit back then in order for that to happen. And so I I think that's what it is more than anything, you know, because things like spirituality and, and, you know, personal transformation work has been around since the beginning of mankind in different forms. And it was mostly men who did it up until the middle of the 20th century. And then as women started to get into it, that's where this whole industry has come out of. But I, I don't think it's because they're more in touch with their feelings. I think it's because that they've needed it. And now men need it, like bad. We need it bad because we have, like, fallen so far behind. Um, and, and, you know, while our women that we're partnered with today have so many resources and really kind of have their shit together in a certain way, um, we're just getting kind of floppier and floppier. Well, it's interesting that you mention that perspective, actually, and um, I think you're right. Uh, I think back to when I think of self-help, I, you know, I think of the one of the sort of granddaddies of this isn't like Napoleon Hill and, right. uh, you know, think and grow rich. And that was very much exactly what you say about powerful men looking to optimize their yeah. uh, their abilities. Think and grow rich was not written for housewives. No. Absolutely not, no. Um, well, what we're going to do is that we're going to walk through, as you said, about getting floppier and floppier. I do like that image. But uh, we'll walk through some of the problems we're facing and then we'll get on to like, what the hell we're going to do about it. But one major issue that I've seen in my life, and it's been on the increase very, very much, uh, is this infantilization that's going on, particularly with men. I was watching um, a couple of things, actually, I saw when I was on holiday recently on the TV. It's probably the only time I ever put on the TV as if I'm in a hotel. Uh, one was the movie Master and Commander with Russell Crowe. And I was reminded that one of the young officer class who's been brought up and trained to be a future captain was, must have been about 10 years old in that film. Yeah. And I was reminded in, in centuries and millennia gone by, men were men when they were well, you know, basically it was puberty, wasn't it? That's when you started doing adult things, maybe even before. Uh, so that was something to, to ponder. And also there was one of these reality cop shows that was on uh, sort of police porn, as I call it. And there was a there was one episode, there was a couple of guys in it. One was 19 years old and he was giving a lot of shit to the cops when they were arresting him. When he got down to the station, his, he changed his tune and he started crying and going on about how his mum was going to kill him. <laughs> and I'm thinking... 
this guy's an adult. This is a man. He's 19, you know, even legally, whatever you want to call it. And there was another guy who uh, got arrested because his motorbike didn't have any license or insurance, uh, tax or insurance rather. And he was 32 and he was saying to the cops that his mum was going to kill him again. And he was living yeah. at home with his mother. And I just, again, I reflected on the differences, what a difference 500 years can make. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that perspective. And thank you for reminding me of, of that movie. Um, you know, I'm in the process of producing a podcast of my own called The Whole Manchilada. <laughs> and um, and uh, one, of the th- one of the features we're going to have is the Manchilada media of the week because there's so many bad portrayals of men in the media of just like doofus dads and, you know, just, you know, kind of fuck nuts, you know. Sorry for, for the foul language. No, say, um, what, say whatever you want. Say it again if you like. Okay. Anyway, so you know these shows where they're like these young guys that are just kind of, they're just fuck nuts. Anyway, so on the whole enchilada, we're trying to really feature different movies and TV shows and different media where they do it right. And yeah, I, I'll have to rewatch Master and Commander, but I do remember that really, I don't want to give it away, but I just remember that really poignant scene where that young, that young boy officer has that injury. Ugh. It's just like it's bringing tears to my eyes just remembering that interaction right now. You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point that, yeah, there is this infantilization thing for sure where, you know, like I'm working with men in their 40s just, you know, in my coaching practice just to help them just be adults in that way that, you know, conditions in the past would force, you know? We don't have conditions now that will force us to, to, to be strong men. Um, you know, we can be considered strong, successful men if, as long as we make enough money and don't get in trouble. That's the bar now that we have to, that we have to rise to. Um, but we don't have to know how to do things with our hands. We don't have to have physical strength. We don't have to have qualities like fearlessness or, um, uh, uh, or like stick to itness because our life just doesn't demand it of us the way that it used to. Um, what I'll see today is I'll see young men who just have some kind of spirit of, of that that will really seek it out. You know, like I'm thinking of all the, all the, you know, the massive volunteer military forces that we have these days. And, you know, I work with a lot of these young men and, um, you know, this is, sorry if this is a tangent, but I, you know, years ago I, I started doing this project where I would offer free coaching and like meditation training to, to veterans of, you know, like post 9-11 veterans. And I expected to get these young guys that were, uh, you know, all fucked up and full of, like, trauma. And, you know, I, I did see some of those, but what I saw was a lot of young men who, um, they had their greatest moment of their life in combat and when they were on deployment. And their problem wasn't getting over the trauma of being on deployment, but it was trying to find a place in, in modern society where they could like be as big and, and have their qualities shine in such a way. You know, there was a, uh, there was a movie called the Incredibles that came out a few years ago. It's like an animated movie about the superhero family that was like living in hiding or something. And they were trying to live straight lives. And Mr. Incredible, the dad of the family was like a super strength. That was his superpower. And um, he was trying to work for an insurance agency. And, you know, there are all these great scenes of him being told off by his little weaselly boss and him getting frustrated and pulling the door off of his car and stuff because he didn't know how to manage his super strength. So I started, uh, when I was working with vets, I, I, I started this term called the incredible syndrome where oftentimes where I would work with one of these young men, and, you know, a lot of times they would enlist when they were 18, 19, 20, and, you know, they'd be like 20 years old leading a team of men in Iraq 
in life and death situations. And then they would come back and, and be expected to like work in some job and just be a consumer. And they would have such a hard time because they, you know, their combat experience forged them as warriors and as, more importantly, as leaders, you know, as people that were like ready to stand up and take charge of shit and, and do stuff. And modern society just, just didn't have a, didn't have a hole for their peg. Mm. And, you know, I, I just, sorry for that tangent, but I, I just think that it's worth mentioning that, you know, you, wa you watch those cop shows, and yeah, you'll, you'll see those, you know, the knuckleheads that are getting arrested, but you also see, you know, a lot of times those cops are in their 20s, and, and they're there doing their best, you know, to, to be men, and to, to like, be men that are making a contribution, and, you know, making sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. I could, if they wanted to do some coaching sessions with me, I might be able to suggest some better options for them than <laughs> going into the police and <laughs> hurling themselves into combat situations. But um, nonetheless, you know, the, that hunger in men is something that is innate. And and so, you know, if, if you look for it, you'll see instances where it pops through the kind of modern malaise of, of uh of you know pussification as one of my friends calls it pussification yeah i like that uh, phrase in your book <laughs> well this is this is very relevant actually and it reminds me of like uh, another movie like first blood you know when yeah. jo john rambo comes back and yeah. he's saying like in nam i was in charge of million do million dollar equipment and back here i can't even hold down a job in a car wash type yeah. thing thinking yeah. of rambo one thing we should put to bed at this early stage is when we're talking about you know men being men and the best that they can be we're not talking about some kind of macho bullshit here we're not talking about it's something that excludes men who are uh, effeminate or men who are gay or men who are skinny. You know, we're not talking about some cliche here. <laughs> skinny. Well, you know what I mean, sort of like... I totally know what you mean. I was just like, I have kind of a visual mind. And so, like, I, as you said that, I had like a little slideshow of like an effeminate man, a gay man, and then the, the skinny man. Um, no, for sure. I mean... You know, what I talk about in, in Backbone and in my workshops and, and coaching and stuff is this idea of, of the, the, the wild man archetype. You know, it's something I, I took from, from Robert Bly. And what that is, is it's so unique to every man. Um, it's just a man has to find out what that is for him. And for some men, it might take the form of something, you know, typically dangerous or typically robust, you know, like a military thing. But for some men, you know, I work with some men that have, like, they're, they are being Rambo, and that's not true for them. What's actually true for them is their wild man is a hell of a lot more sensitive and spiritual and, you know, much more of, of you know, an effeminate sort of thing, but that is them expressing their wild man. Um, but yeah, for sure, the, you know, like in the book, I talk about these universal qualities and universal uh, inner enemies that, that men have to deal with. And um, the reason I do that is specifically for that, you know, like I, how I enjoy my masculinity and how I express myself as a father and as a leader, and as a business owner, and as a man in this world, that's for me, you know? And it's not going to work necessarily for any other man. I remember uh, when I was growing up, uh, my father wasn't around. It was my grandfather who basically became effectively my father. And I remember when my grandmother died, uh, my grandfather was, you know, obviously incredibly devastated by this, but it was almost one year after she died that I was in a room alone with him and he basically, he cried and he said that he really missed her. Mm. And that was like almost a year and he never said anything in the interim. Now, you could look at that and say, we've come a long way since then and it's healthy that maybe, you know, guys of, of our generation can, can speak more openly, you know, for the most part about what we're really feeling. But there's also extremes are not healthy. And I think that's one of the things that you've noted in uh, the self-help revolution being female orientated. Yeah. Is that uh, you know either extreme is not really a place where we want to be? 
Right. Yeah, because you know what we have today is you know what our what our grandfathers had is they had the ability to put their feelings aside to get the shit done that they needed to get done. And that was a very important quality. Uh, you know, and as you go further and further back in history, especially for men that had to do a lot more dangerous work in general, um, and that quality was more and more important. Uh, but then what would happen is, especially when we look at people like our grandfathers from a post-1960s point of view, they seem like they were really emotionally kind of stopped up, you know, or like emotionally contracted or something. Um, and so what I find today is that, you know, well, you know, that still exists. There is still that thing where like men don't know how to access any emotion except for anger and lust, um, sexual lust. Um, and, you know, we help them to kind of flush that out a little bit and, and, and put some, put some meat on the bones of their emotional body. Um, but, you know, just as often I'll have these men that just need to learn how to just shut the fuck up about their feelings, you know, especially when it comes to like heterosexual men being really sloppy about their emotional lives with their women, because that just kills their relationships. Um, you know, and, and learn how to like work through what they need to work through with the men in their life, but to learn how to like, do stuff even if they don't feel like it and like do hard stuff even if their emotions think something else you know I, i'm getting ready to do this motorcycle tour you know literally as soon as we hang up the phone i'm going to chuck my stuff into my saddlebags and and hit the road for for uh, a 3200 mile it's like 5000 kilometer uh motorcycle tour to promote the book and um Man, I tell you what, a couple of days ago, I, you know, I was going through this thing where I was telling one of my men, I'm ready to, like, sell the bike and fly home and just go go to my swimming hole by my house and go swimming because this shit is going to be hard and, you know, all this doubt was coming up. And, um, you know, what what my brother had to say to me it was, you know, basically suck it the fuck up. This is what you're doing, and it's going to be great. And if you weren't scared about it, it wouldn't be worth doing. And, you know, and he was also really encouraging. Like, you're going to help a lot of people. And even if you, you know, he said, in knowing you, he said to me, knowing you, even if you just help one man on this whole journey, you will consider it to be successful. And that's what I needed to hear, you know, my, 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 uh, my partner, you know, the mother of my children, um, when I shared it with her, she was like, oh, baby, well, just know you don't have to do it. If you really don't want to have to do it, you don't have to do, you know, that was her reaction. And that's not what I, need. you know, I needed to be coddled a little bit, but I needed my brother, you know, one of the men in my life to really give me a kick in the ass and, 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 and help me to keep doing it. Yeah, this is kind of going against the, 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 the popular grain as it stands at the moment with yeah. uh, with regard to men and uh, if uh, heterosexual men and their female partners is that the, the idea is that, well, actually you can be, if you're completely open about absolutely everything, then this is can only be a good thing. But actually there are limits and you point out, and this is something I had to ponder as well with regard to my own life is like, if you do this, what effect does it have on your relationship? Are there some things? And this is not to go back to being withdrawn or bottling things up dangerously. It's just that what's appropriate and when is it appropriate? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. You know, like, it, not to get too graphic or anything, but, um, you know, like, our women don't share all the details of their menstruation with us. You know, like how heavy their flow is or, you know, like some things will just naturally be shared with us, like if they're not feeling well or whatever, but that's a whole private part of their life. It is a major part of their life that they only would share with other women. in it. And it's important for men to have those private corners too. Um, and, and it's just as, it's just as legitimate. It's like, you know, one of the things that happened probably after the sixties you know, to kind of like rein men in a little bit 
was that we're not supposed to have any secrets, um, especially from our women, because that's, you know, somehow threatening for them. But I just don't think that that's healthy. I think that it's, it's really important for everyone to have a private life, everyone. And, you know, between men and women, for sure, there are going to be things in a man's life that are just better, you know, shared only with his men and, like, protect, you know, like, leave his wife protected from it. Otherwise, it just causes chaos and havoc. And, and you know, meanwhile, if he just keeps it to him, say, for instance, he's, uh, the example I always use is, like, a, a man comes home to dinner with his wife and kids and says, honey... I'm afraid the business is going to fail. It's doing really bad these past few weeks, and I'm starting to have this terrible fear that it's going to fail, and if it fails, we're going to go in debt, and I just can't handle that, and I just feel like shooting myself in the head. I just, I would just kill myself <laughs> because I can't handle it. <laughs> you know, And like what that would do to the wife and kids to like lay that burden on them. That's what one of the men's groups that I, I, I'm connected with calls uh, going home with a poopy diaper. As opposed to, like, if he just shares that with his men in a men's group or, you know, with a mentor or just with his, with his trusted male friends, they could just hear that and be like, okay, well, you know, I hear that. That must be hard, and what are you going to do about it? And then he can, like, still hold all of that, and he doesn't have to, like, keep it bottled up inside. He can share his feelings. But like my friend did for me about my, about my tour doubts, um, you know, actually support us to share our feelings, but then also to take care of our business. One thing I notice, it's a, a side effect of trends of the last few decades. I'm thinking back to that cop show I mentioned earlier. Is, uh, I see this, I mean, you can see it on a Saturday night if you go downtown. It's young men lashing out. It's this yeah. random violence. Yeah. Um, and it's coming from a place of insecurity and yeah. fear. I mean, they don't know what they're supposed to do. And maybe they haven't even intellectualized this. Maybe this thought has never crossed their mind. But I think that's where it's coming from. And you even see the old uh, cliche was that, you know, when you became a father, for example, that you'd really grow up, you know, then you'd be a man. It would be the making of you. But I see young guys uh, walking along with, with young girls and there's a, you know, the stroller there and a, a couple of kids in it. And it, it, becoming a father has not been the making of them at all. They're just as likely to go downtown on Saturday night and lash out at some total stranger because they don't know what they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to do. They're not having that, uh, they're not getting this handed down to them. As you point out, it used to be a generational thing. Yeah, for sure. And where, where are you there? Where are you? Uh, right, right in the middle of England in, in Yorkshire. Yeah, so there, there, there's a different kind, as I understand it, there's also a different kind of like that young male aggression and the sort of football hooligans and all that kind of thing. Um, it's even more corked up in the West. You know, like young men don't even lash out that much um, outwardly. But what they do, you know, over here is almost more of an internal lashing out where they'll just, you know, sit around and smoke pot and, you know, beat off watching porn and playing video games and just kind of like slowly waste away um, and instead of like, you know, lashing out and beating people up and stuff like that. So mm. like, yeah, it's just like different different uh, forms of lostness. But, you know, what I, I don't know if... um. And how true this is, but I looked it up the other day because I, I was writing something about that expression, suck it up. Um, that I don't know if you use that there, but, and do you know what the origin of it is? Um, it was probably unpleasant, but I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, super <laughs> unpleasant. Um, it, the, the best answer I could get is the origin is it came from World War II, uh, uh, pilots, like military pilots, that when they would be in air combat, would oftentimes throw up from the motion sickness and they would have an oxygen mask and oh my God. <laughs> they'd have to suck it up and keep fighting. That was where the expression comes from because, you know, they'd be like in the middle of it. You know, if they didn't suck it up, they'd die. So <laughs> as I like just put a little bit more graphic, uh, graphic quality in that for you. Now, one of the key ideas in your book you set out is this idea of two roads. And yeah. I think if you say a little bit about that, it puts everything that we're saying into context. Yeah, it's from the Agla Lakota tradition. And 
yesterday I actually had the honor of, of gifting a book to a young Lakota man um, who my motorcycle club is a, is a heavily Native American club and we do a scholarship uh, for Native American youth every year and um, the recipient was a Lakota boy and I gave him a copy of, of Backbone. And the, the Red Road and the Black Road, as you're referring to, uh, is a, it's an Agalala Lakota Native American uh, idea. And I have a few of those ideas in the book, so it's, it's cool to actually be able to give, give a book to somebody from that nation. But, um, yeah, the idea is that, that the, the Black Road is kind of the road of unconsciousness and, uh, you know, the path of least resistance you could say, uh, in, in the, the path of, of just not being really fully alive, whereas the red road is the road of consciousness and honor and people really taking the time to figure out who they are and, and live in an excellent way. And I like that because coming back to that thing of like what makes a man a real man or what makes a man a, a truly strong man, um, it's that's what it comes down to is it's like, how much are we living consciously on that red road? And then that allows for what we were talking about and the really very individual expression of what that is. Because the black road, that's easy. It's wide, it's flat, everybody's there, it's very popular. Um, you can sleepwalk down the down the black road, but the red road, you have to be awake, you know, it's it's like a narrow winding path that, that changes all the time and what's a red road, you know, like a conscious choice for you today can turn into a black road unconscious choice in, you know, in a year. You know, it's like if we decide that, you know, the secret to our happiness is to, you know, get baptized and, and become a Christian or something like that, that might be a red road decision. But then pretty soon we fall into the dogma and just the unconsciousness of being part of a part of an organized religion that does all the thinking for us and we ended up back on a different black road again. So, yeah, thank, thank you for mentioning that. It seems easy, doesn't it, on the face of it, the black road. It's kind of like you don't really yeah. have to do anything. You don't have to try. You just kind of go along to get along. But it's, it's really not in the long run, is it? I mean, there's a great expression you have in the book, uh, Suicide by Installments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. It's like, the black road is easy on the front end, but really hard on the back end. Whereas the red road is almost the opposite. It might take some more effort now, but the but really the prize of it is is you know a glorious life and and an honorable death. And the media is culpable here as well, isn't it? Because I mentioned at the top of the hour about you know the, the macho cliches that when you some of the you probably run a, up against this yourself when you're talking about some of these things. The media always likes to have a bit of conflict and to polarize things. And yeah. so they might cast someone like you as sort of, oh, yeah, this guy who says that, you know, we don't want to be in touch with our feminine side and all the rest of it. And that that means that we have the, some of the trends that we've described have been encouraged by the, the culture at large, you know, in terms of infantilization, in terms of, uh, you know, men wanting to be not distinct from women whatsoever, you know, really there, there's no difference between us, you know, etc. Of course there are, you know, on the plus and negative sides, that's just the way things are and uh, has always been. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it's like the, that's what I'm trying to kind of awaken is, is this idea of really being proud to be a man. You know, men, especially, especially white men, they're like, they're like the new sort of shameful minority or something. <laughs> Whereas like there's like this automatic assumption that there, that there's something bad about us. And what I'm into is like men really being proud of being men. And like pride comes when we invest in something. If we really invest in, in whatever it is, whether it's our, our dog or, you know, a car or a project, and certainly ourselves, you know, pride comes when we really put the effort into something, invest in it until it really shines and it's just the way that we want it and it's got a, that quality of excellence to it. Then we can really hold our head up about it, you know, 
Um, and that's why I want men to feel about their manhood itself. Thinking again back to our grandfather's generation, I'm thinking now in terms of uh, media and in terms of popular culture and in terms of distractions, uh, black road type distractions. 50 to you know, 100 years ago, it uh, would have been the woman of the house, for example, who uh, would have had perhaps some interest in uh, celebrity culture, you know, who was in the uh, popular press uh, when movies came along, you know, who the movie stars were. Um, what was in the stores, you know, what were the new items that you could buy. There's nothing wrong on the face of it with any of that, okay? I have an interest up to a point in what the new consumer gadgets are. I have an interest up to a point in what what celebrities are doing, you know. But men now, uh, particularly young men, are as likely to be, uh, when we think of this in terms, in negative terms, as likely to be swallowed up by consumerism and celebrity culture as anyone else. Yep, yep. Yep, and and like celebrity culture, and and what I see even more than that is just like really kind of empty social media stuff. You know what I mean? They're where they're just always looking at their phone or their computer, or their tablet. For it's it's almost like news about celebrities is a little bit more substantial than what a lot of young men are lost in now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you know what? I, I'm getting this going on, and uh, maybe you can speak to this. At the back of my mind, there's a little voice that's trying to police myself. It's saying that what I'm saying is somehow I shouldn't be saying it. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's funny. I, I was just, I'm here in Brooklyn where I'm staying while I'm on tour in New York. And uh, in a particularly kind of liberal enclave of, of Brooklyn, and the place where I get coffee um, there was a there was a young woman and a young man behind the bar, and somehow we started talking about the smell of bacon because it smelled like bacon in the cafe and it smelled really good. And uh, the the young man said, "Yeah, I heard about this these things called mandals. They're scented candles for <laughs> scented candles for men, and there's a bacon a bacon smell one." And the woman, young woman. She was kind of cool, you know, I had like blue hair and was, you know, kind of cool. She kind of rolled her eyes and she said, ah, a uselessly gendered product. Hmm. And I was just there waiting for my coffee and I said, yeah, I guess so. But you know what? You know, I, I understand, you know, I was sort of like trying to have the back of, of men a little bit. I was like, no, I understand, you know, like men want to have scented candles too and they just are not into, you know, the smell of lilacs and stuff like that. And um, she said, well, what are you, some kind of men's rights activist? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, I'm not a men's rights activist. I would call myself a men's happiness advocate. And I was having my launch party for the tour that night. And I told her, I was, you know, I'm having this, I wrote this men's book, you know, and, and uh, why don't you come to the party? And she said, well, I was a gender studies major, so no, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pass on this one. And it was just the assumption that, like, if it was anything that was about men's empowerment or men's happiness, that it was somehow going to be um, anti-feminist. Mm, yeah. And it's so important to say, you know, that that would be a really big backward step if it were to be anti-feminist because, you know, it's – really true women needed to to have a whole different kind of level of rights and respect that they have um that they have earned and and that they have insisted on and and made for themselves in the, in the past few decades that's a beautiful thing we don't want to lose that it's just that and the thing is it's just that we just want to catch up not in terms of rights or respect or any of that stuff. We can just earn that if we stop acting like douchebags. It's just a matter of, of um, you know, I, I got into this work with men after decades of working with mostly women and hearing them complain about their men and, and just hearing them just talk about how they were into spirituality and evolution and all this stuff and their men were just like lumps sitting at home you know, on the couch while they were at the meditation retreat. Yeah. So, you know, it's really important to say that the vision that Backbone is about, the vision that this 
American Backbone tour that I'm doing is about. Um, it's a vision where everyone rises. Because if the men can, can rise up and start to match these amazing, powerful women that we have now, um, the whole world is going to benefit. You know, then we're going to have some synergy, you know. Otherwise, it's like Obama in the White House, you know, and he's got all these great ideas, but all of these, uh, all of the, you know, his detractors constantly pulling him back. Well, now we have all of these moms of the household that, you know, eat organic food and study meditation and, you know, read Deepak Chopra, and, and dad is still living in the 1970s, um, kind of holding the whole thing back. We get dad on board. We get dad, you know, enlivened and empowered and switched on. Um, that whole family is going to just rise up. Well, as far as being an, a quote-unquote activist goes, I mean, we live in such a apathetic, dumbed-down culture in general, particularly yeah. in the West, that if you do anything, if you get off your ass and do anything yeah. whatsoever that's meaningful, you're an activist. You yeah. know, it's it's become portrayed almost as a bad thing, hasn't it? You know, oh, you're an activist. You know, that means you're a troublemaker or whatever it happens to be. Well, you know, maybe making some trouble would be a good thing. But one thing I want to address. I should, I should have said if she asked me if I was a men's rights activist, I should have said I'm not an activist. I'm just active. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm awake. I'm not an activist. But, yeah, I'm, I'm active. Yeah, it's a better way of putting it, isn't it, really? But this whole issue of uh, pornography leading yeah. to a sort of distorted view of sexuality. This, for me, is very important. I, I, we've got a real problem on our hands here, and it has... Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> 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 yes, we're a real problem. But, you know, in our day, when we were when we were teenagers, whatever, I don't know about you, but access to pornography, I mean, this is something you think about, of course, when you're, you reach a certain age, but it would have consisted of top shelf magazines, you know, yeah. relative, yeah. relatively harmless. Today, since the internet in particular, I mean, I'm told, I've never actually looked into this, but I'm told that pornography is the single biggest sort of sector, if you want to put it like that, on, yeah. on the internet. Now, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not a father, but if I had kids, and uh, I've got friends who do have kids, and I've, I've actually talked to them about this, you know, what, what do you do with regards to internet access and pornography and all the rest of it? It would be an absolute minefield. I don't know what the hell I would do, but I think bottom line is, I think this is has led to huge problems. In fact, it was only a few months ago I read an article by a young, written by a young man. I think he was about 21 at the time. But he talked about how he felt that his consumption of, of internet pornography and, you know, pretty extreme stuff since he was first took an interest in this, he felt that it almost ruined his life because he couldn't relate to women anymore. He couldn't, you know, his entire sexual life involved extreme hardcore pornography. And um, he just felt that it, it ruined him. Yeah. Yeah, you know... I talk about this a lot, you know, and there's, there's different aspects to it. But since you, since you mentioned like being a father, you know, I am a father of a boy and um, my boy's only three, so he hasn't quite discovered porn yet. Um, but, you know, honestly, really and truly, if you think about it, for better or for worse, pornography is the way that a lot of young people learn about sex today. And so I think that, you know, it, First of all, let me just let me back up and just say that with the men that I work with, you know, I just encourage I encourage them to be conscious about it, you know, if they do if they do use porn, and also just to be conscious and make sure that their sex life in some way is enhanced by it. In other words, like they're either learning something or they're learning what turns them on so that then they can go out and have a more robust actual sex life instead of it being a replacement. But as far as, like, young people and kids go, I think I would want to, like, sit down with my son and, and look at some porn together and, and be able to say, okay, look, this is bullshit, you know? Because, quite frankly, there's all different kinds of, of porn now available. And um, I'll, I'll have some of my, my uh, coaching clients, actually, sometimes um, – use porn it's especially for uh for women who are really shut down in their sexuality in some way or another um to find out what it is that turns them on and, and to kind of learn about themselves sexually uh and and so over that i've just 
I've just learned that there's a whole world of of porn that isn't you know like demeaning hardcore stuff. Anyway, I would just want to sit down with with my boy and just say, look, you know, this is bullshit. This is not how it is. Um, here, this other thing, this is kind of how it is. And if you watch this, you might actually learn something, son. Just don't use this as a replacement for the real thing. <laughs> I was reading an article a while ago written by a woman, actually, and it was about, it was, I, I can't remember the exact title to paraphrase. It was something like why women find James Bond attractive. Uh, now, when I look at the character of James Bond, I don't think him was particularly, you know, wholesome or attractive. Not somebody I'd necessarily like to be like. I'd like some of his super skills, um, yeah. in certain areas. But she made an interesting point that even if you look at the character of James Bond and think, think this guy's basically a psychopath, her article said, well, what is it that, g- that gets some women excited about this this guy and she the stuff she picked out was actually not the stuff that you think about abseiling down the front of uh you know foreign embassies and taking out bad guys with a pencil and all the other stuff but it was like he knows how to dress uh yeah. he knows how to look after himself he knows how to cook uh you look at places he, he where you see him at home it's clean um he's yeah. self-reliant you don't see a pile of of smelly old socks in the middle of james bond living room do you know what i mean so there are a lot of cliches in there, and he's arguably a relic from a bygone age. But this was written by a woman; it was very convincing. It, you know, it made me think. Yeah, I mean, I I totally get it. I mean, and this is the again the so the question that I'm asking on this tour this tour I'm I'm calling it a vision quest, where I am I'm going out to ask the question: What do American men need? to be excellent again. I, because I'm in America. I mean, I work with men all over the world, but this tour is in America. So, um, Because there was like an, an excellence, you know, in bygone era. And, of course, there's all kinds of, if you look at it from a political point of view, um, yeah, there were, you know, whatever, bigots and slave owners and, you know, <laughs> like rape the ecology and everything else. But mm. that said... Um, yeah, it's like, you know, my, my old neighbor, Tom, who's like 93, uh, he can't even barely walk, but man, he does not go out of the house without a shirt on and his hair combed. He wouldn't think twice. He he wouldn't, he wouldn't imagine going out in public for dinner with his wife, uh, without his shoes being shined, you know? And it's not because he's a neat freak, because it, th- there's just something about a level of self-respect and, again, that consciousness. That's really what the Red Road is like. And, it's not again, it's not to say that it's like, well, a man on the Red Road combs his hair and shines his shoes. I mean, look at me. I don't fucking comb my hair. But the way that my hair is is exactly how I want it to be. Hmm. And I've, like, consciously decided that, no, what... What my thing is, is, you know, I wear motorcycle boots and grow my beard because that's what I feel like is beautiful, you know, from in a masculine way for me. Um, but, yeah, I, I get it, you know, why, you know, the, the James Bond character or, um, you know, one of the Manchalata Media things for, for my webcast is um, there's a HBO series called Deadwood about uh, Deadwood, South Dakota in the, like, 1840s. And um, you know, there's this one particular character, Seth Bullock, who's, who's like a sheriff, and he's played by Timothy Oliphant. And aside from Timothy Oliphant just being this beautiful, good-looking, studly man, um, his character is, like, has all of these qualities, you know, where he, like, is pre- he, like, has his shit together, you know, to just put it in a, in a short, blunt way. Um, and that means b- kicking somebody's ass if they really need it, but also knowing how to restrain his violence if, it, if restraint is called for. And he's, like, honorable to his word, and he's chivalrous towards women. And, you know, he's like someone that you can depend on because he's a solid man. And that's what women are turned on by more than anything. And what they're turned off by more than anything is when they just feel like they can't trust us. 
Not because they think that we're going to like screw around on them or have an affair or something like that. They get turned off when they don't trust us because we don't know ourselves. And they can see it. They can smell it. And they can just smell that, like, you know, we don't have a backbone. And so we're just going to, like, go for whatever feels good in the moment instead of, like, having some kind of a deep moral code that, that guides us. And um, so I totally get it. And, and, you know, most of them wouldn't admit it, especially when they're getting into a relationship. They want a man that they feel like isn't going to have any secrets, isn't going to give them any hard time about anything, isn't going to give them too much of a fight, isn't going to, like, be like flirting with their girlfriends and not going to be sexy enough for their girlfriends to want them to flirt with her. That's what they think they want. <laughs> but actually then once they get into the relationship and everything just falls flat and that, you know, nice guy that they got in the relationship with has turned them into their mama, then they start looking for James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Well, polit political correctness has got a, a role in all of this, hasn't it, really, to the point where um, holding a door open for a woman can be seen as an insult. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. And, you know, it's just like holding the door open for an old person or something. You know, it's like it's just something about... Um, I believe that a man of honor just has an awareness of his surroundings and has an awareness of, he has a responsibility to look after others around him that are weaker than he is in different ways. So not to say that like a woman is weaker than he is, or, or an old person is necessarily weaker. I, again, like I, I myself am hearing that little voice of political correctness. But you know what I mean? It's like, it's up to him if there are kids around, he is an adult in the room. He has to look after those kids. It doesn't matter if they're somebody else's kids. You know, if there are, you know, women or old people or um, handicapped people or just who, whoever, he has something to offer to. He needs to offer it. That's what I believe. And, and, not, and it's not a moral thing. It's just that as I coach men and, and I encourage them to do that work, and to start paying attention to stuff like that. And just even as simple as just like saying please and thank you and meaning it to strangers, um, they start to feel better. There's an energy that comes into them when, you know, they're walking down the street with the awareness of this street is my world, and this world is my responsibility. And so if there's a piece of trash there, if I can pick it up, I should pick it up. And if there's, like, you know, a bully picking on somebody, that, and I have the potency, I have the power to do something about it, it's my responsibility to step up for that person that's being bullied. And, you know, there's just something about that that just puts, like, a new life into a man once he starts realizing that potential. Well, I just want to say a word also about nature in all of this. And this is a key thread that runs throughout your book as well in terms of uh, disconnectedness from nature. Yeah. And this is very important. And again, it's one of the sort of buzzwords of our, of our age, you know, like getting reconnecting with nature because, you know, most of us are now living in cities and that's a trend that's increasing and it's a man-made environment. And even the nature that's there in terms of green spaces and trees has all been laid out. And this is something, again, going back to, Form, former ages, other times when we wouldn't have been so connected with nature. In fact, we've been intimately involved with it on a daily basis. And there's something in here as well in terms of getting in touch, you know, with who you are and what you can be. And, you know, nature can form a very important part of that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it, it actually it goes back to my previous point. You know, like in, in, in the Lakota tradition, in any of the Native American traditions, or pretty much any indigenous tradition around the world. But in, especially in the Lakota tradition, they have this, uh, this phrase that they'll say when they're doing a sacred ceremony or like a sweat lodge or something, Aho Matakwiasin. And Matakwiasin means all of our relations. And what that refers to is in that worldview, a tree isn't just an object on our land, that tree is like our brother. 
And that land also isn't an object. That land is our mother. And so then a man in that in that worldview, however fierce they are, even if they're like the fiercest warrior, they have this this sense of responsibility towards the natural world um, of of honoring it and taking care of it as something that like you could say is weaker than they are because that tree um, it can be cut down by an insensitive person. You know the the land can be spoiled by a bully, you know, that wants to, like, use it as a dump. And so, you know, there's definitely, there's the connectedness, but then there's also that quality of, of standing up for, uh, standing up for the, for the delicate things in life that I believe is really part of being a strong man. Just in closing, David, um, towards the end of the book, you've got an entire section on really, you know, what the hell we're going to do about all this. Should we find ourselves? <laughs> Should we recognize ourselves in any of what we've been talking about? And it's it's dealing with the bullshit, basically. And that, as you point out, can be mental. It can be physical. You've got a whole section, what you call life bullshit. And that's uh, the point where this all comes together. And you've got a, you know, a, basically a plan uh, for, for, for dealing with our bullshit and, and how we can move beyond it. Because our bullshit, you know, as, as I call it um, in, in kind of a crude way, I suppose, um, because it has so many facets to it, in general, I like to work with people in, in kind of an in-depth way. So, and, and whether I work with them or they work on their own, it's going to be a journey. You know, what I, what I tell people, it's not a very sexy sales pitch. You know, because, you know, self-help people and, you know, spiritual teachers or whatever, we always have, like, a weekend that will fix all your problems or, you know, a book that will, you know, heal all of your, your maladies. But, you know, like, if you, you should read Backbone for sure because it, it's, it's a great starting point for men or women to understand what it means for a man to, like, walk a, walk a conscious path. But then be ready for a process, you know, like when I when I coach people, you know, I, I like to coach them in six or twelve week increments because that gives us time to actually, you know, work through some stuff, go practice it, come back, report, work with some stuff, you know, go out, work with it, come back. And and then that really deep kind of transformation can happen. Um and I, I just I think that that's really important that people are ready to have this beautifully sloppy trial and error kind of process to to make the transformations that they need to make to to really to really live that life. And so um, yeah, so that that's that's the main thing that I would say. The specific thing depends on the specific person. You know, some people need need a certain kind of path and. Other people need to walk a totally different road um, towards their transformation. But that is what I say is don't be, you know, don't expect for something to just be a quick fix. Now, that said, you know, a lot of men especially do have a commitment issue. And so, you know, they're like six weeks of coaching. I don't know if I can commit to that. <laughs> so I, I do this what I call a cage fight option where a man can sign up to just do one hardcore session with me where it's not like they're cage fighting with me but he and I are cage fighting with his bullshit and just knocking through as much stuff as we can in that time and it, that is effective provided that he takes what we do in that hour and then works with it um, but oftentimes what happens is, is we'll do that cage fight and then they'll be like you know calling me back you know a week later and being like can we do that again <laughs> because you know it takes it takes some time you know like it takes some time to unfuck yourself it, because if it's just like one little thing that we have to work on then we can do that but usually we're fucked a little bit like there's all these different aspects of our life or of our of our manhood that need adjustment um, that's what I, you know, so graciously refer to as being fucked. <laughs> and so, like, if you're going to unfuck yourself, it, it takes a minute. And and so, you know, people have to be prepared to walk away. 
David, today we've been talking about your book. Just to remind listeners, it's called Backbone, The Modern Man's Ultimate Guide to Purpose, Passion and Power. You've mentioned that you do workshops. You're about to hit the road on tour. Um, tell folks about any of that, the website, just anything you'd like to share. Yeah, you can you can see details about what I do on davidhwagner.com. Don't forget the H in that, davidhwagner.com. Um, you can follow me on Facebook. It's also David H. Wagner. Instagram, it's men's underscore revolution. Um, Twitter, David H. Wagner. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to update everything that I'm doing on the tour on there. Um, we have a, a mentor training program for men that's happening this year. I'm really excited about that. It's a nine-month-long intensive program for men to learn how to actually coach other men. Um, and, you know, I'm always doing weekends and, and you know, different workshops around. So just check out the website, check out my social media, and uh, get in touch. Excellent. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you, Greg. This is a great interview. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's LegalizeFreedom.com, Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.